Hi, uh, welcome to this week's lecture to content, which is um, about DIY punk and everyday struggles. So what I'll be doing in this in this content um, is breaking it up into three parts. I'll start off quite generally talking about the what is DIY and the concept of it and the way it's been kind of co-opted a little bit. And then in parts two and three, I'll talk more directly about some research that I've been doing over the past few years um, on the east coast of Australia. Um, in a kind of underground punk and DIY scene with people that are in bands that run venues that have their own record labels that uh, make zines and make you know merch and art and t-shirts and stuff and in part so in the first part of that in part two I'll be looking at the kind of struggles over what is punk and DIY and in this um, second part of that kind of case study I'll be looking in some gender struggles um, about a particular incident that happened in the scene so this week's content um, it also connects with next week where I talk about some more broad stuff that's going on in the lives of those young people where they kind of, I suppose, use their punk ethic to make decisions about careers. And I suppose that's a good way of bridging that youth culture and youth transitions gap. So part one is about what is DIY. Um, so the um, research that I'm um, talking about here was done over the past kind of four years, I think, maybe five years. Um, and I've written it up in a couple of papers and also a couple of chapters in the book um, Youth Class and Everyday Struggles. Um, so in terms of the broad kind of youth culture theories, you know, subcultures, neo-tribes or scenes, I think the idea of scene works best um, because it has this kind of interconnected kind of local and global aspects going on that I think um, the Will Straw's theory of scene capture qu captures quite well. Um, the scene itself spans across, you know, a huge, huge part of Australia. I, you know, I've got listed kind of most of the East Coast cities there, but even there's kind of bands in Perth that connect to it every now and then. And it also has a kind of more broadly international thing where um, um, it goes into Southeast Asia. Some of the bands tour there, some of them tour through Europe and America. Um, and there's certainly a really big connection with New Zealand. Very broadly, um, it's been kind of, there's a book called The Ugly... Australian Underground that was written about some of the bands in the scene that I'll touch upon in a minute. So that's a kind of way of thinking about it, I suppose. Um, a kind of genre sprung out of this scene called Dull Wave that I'll talk about in some detail as well. But what it's important to consider here is that um, there's a bunch of music genres that kind of play in the gigs organised around this and it evolves over time. It's, you know, it's probably quite different now than it was even when I started um, looking into it five years ago. There's a bunch of different sounds, you know, abstract noise bands and hardcore, kind of more jangly, um, flying nun style pop and down a rock and there's kind of post-punk and post-riot girl stuff. Um, and there is an increasingly feminist uh, bent to the scene and I'll discuss the reasons for that soon. Um, but, so, but what unites it, I suppose, is this kind of broadly punk attitude um, and a kind of need to want to do it yourself. It does, these bands don't really want to get played on Triple J even. Um, in fact, a few of the bands in the scene that kind of made it to that level, they broke up then and kind of they start doing something else. Um, they don't see that as kind of being a goal. They don't really want to play, you know, Splendor in the grass and things like that. So they reject even those indie labels that kind of themselves are trying to separate themselves from the kind of mainstream, I suppose. Um, they mostly strongly want to do everything themselves and that includes you know carting their gear around making their records doing the artwork making the merch um, so again that's the broad kind of I think ethic that um, unites the scene and I would um, theorize that um, around the ideas of Borgia's Illusio that I'll discuss a, a little bit more in a second as well the DIY has long been a kind of concept um, in punk music um, I suppose in many ways it's one of the kind of more important ethics and, and features of the of like what being a punk means even from the, when it started in the 70s. But again there's kind of debates over that about how much you know punks do it themselves, how much it was kind of co-opted, how much punk became part of the music industry. But very broadly in those kind of various scenes around the world and particularly you know I'm not necessarily talking about kind of London in the, the 70s and New York in the 70s as these kind of scenes developed um, throughout you know different cities throughout the world um, there was a kind of this notion of DIY and spaces were created in all these different cities you know different scenes where you know like-minded people would gather together um, to try and kind of you know create things that were resistive that were outside the commercial um, culture industries 
these kind of anonymous spaces to create, um, to build communities and, you know, to, to be themselves in many ways. But DIY has kind of moved beyond that in many ways. Um, I mean, in sociology, it's been used in a number of different ways. The, the concept has been kind of co-opted a little bit by sociology as well. Beck and, Gid, uh, Beck and Beck Gernsheim talk about the notion of DIY biographies that, you know, that bring in kind of notions of individualization and reflexivity that I've already talked about in the course. Um, uh, Anita Harris and Josh Rouse have written about DIY citizenship and there's a special issue of cultural sociology that talks about DIY careers, which is um, kind of what I'm be talking about in the next lecture. But the concept itself has even been more broadly co-opted in that sense. And like today, you know, DIY seems to be mostly about, you know, renovating your house and, you know, making your own beer or something. So it's kind of in that sense, like, you know, much of the kind of ethics and symbols of alternate or resistive cultures, they get kind of co-opted, um, their resistive meanings and practices get kind of taken out. Um, and they're kind of then used to sell us stuff. So, you know, you can see this through the rise of kind of, um, you know, shows like The Block and um, all those kind of things. So DIY here, you know, Bunnings is basically using it all the time. Brew your own beer, DIY ch um, cheese kits, even, you know, obviously IKEA has kind of based much of its kind of promotion of itself through those notions. And if you type in DIYP into Google, at least, you know, when I did it, a few years ago to take this screen capture. DIY punk isn't even the things that kind of Google predicts. Um, so you can see here these processes of co-optation of a concept uh, are quite um, obvious. So there's been some sociological work around this. Uh, Weir in particular has written a great little book on this that talks about how there's been a kind of general rise um, in people doing it themselves that isn't always about co-optation and sometimes it's about identity work. And he points about points to some, some examples how there's increasingly people building, repairing, and making stuff themselves. Now this does have those kind of consumerist aspects where maybe people are kind of, you know, um, being influenced by television shows or advertising or whatever. But he points out that some of this behaviour is a way of kind of dealing with a fast, complex world, a way of kind of maybe thinking about simpler times. Um, and, you know, not just kind of about this kind of economic impulse, I suppose. DIY has been associated with the hipster quite a lot that I've already spoke about in the course as well. That kind of move back towards, you know, single origin coffee and, you know, having your own whiskey distillery or something. So there's lots of examples about people doing it themselves in that sense that aren't just about, you know, punk collectives. People moving back to the land, you know, just kind of sea change things and, you know, growing their own food in the backyard. The rise of things like self-governed worker collectives and um, um, increasing people homeschooling. There's lots of things going on around the geographies of cities, you know, with squats and rise of kind of um, um, places like Christiana in Copenhagen, where like this is kind of fenced off part of the city where people go and smoke pot and you can't, the police don't really go in there very much. Um, there's a whole bunch of kind of, you know, proto hippie stuff going on in there. Um, and certainly the kind of return in many ways of the z of zines, you know, little um, homemade um, magazines, and even the rise of things like blogs and stuff like that, where people can um, have the ability to create their own opinion pieces and media outside of the culture industries, can be seen of these kind of can be seen as examples of this DIY stuff. We points to kind of three different groups or types of DIYers: the individualists, the coordinators, and the lifestylers. Um, and I think the people that I'm going to talk about in this um, are mostly coordinators and lifestylers, um, but I won't go into that in too much detail. So I'm using DIY in this um, in this work in two interconnected ways to talk a little bit about the DIY biography biography stuff that Beck and Giddens talk about. This has gone under like a lot of critical discussion that I've spoken about early in the course in debates over, you know, how much. Um, reflexivity and individualization matters and how much things like you know traditional class and gender inequalities matter but also to talk um, DIY more importantly in terms of the punk ethos here um, these kind of political social ethical values drawn upon to kind of live your life so my research here shows that um, um, what, what's interesting about some of these scenes is that is often people kind of come into them because they feel like outsiders themselves in kind of, I suppose, the mainstream world. And they um, find other like-minded people to be around. 
um, and they can then kind of find some comfort and security by being, you know, with other people that are like them, and this can therefore um, engender all kinds of really creative situations. But what it also means, if you take on this punk ethos, is that um, there's a rejection of many kind of mainstream decisions. So, um, you know, this opting out of education systems and not really taking on the rat race, and this means kind of accepting relative po poverty in many ways, that again I'll talk, talk about later on in the course. So, just as a quick reminder here, it's like, I'm, I'm kind of theorizing this through the notions of Bourdieu's notion of illusio. I think in many ways we can think of it about this punk ethic as an illusio. It's a way that people invest themselves into things, create meaning, um, and try and kind of establish a kind of satisfying life, I suppose. And also the notion of social gravity here speaks to why people are drawn to these things. Um, people are pushed and pulled by things beyond their control, but in this sense, they're kind of impelled towards being part of these scenes because there's other like-minded people um, that they can hang around with, as I already said. But once you start kind of participating in a scene like this, in the other kind of notion of gravity, it becomes more serious and people invest themselves in the meanings of the scene more and more and more. And it becomes more about more who they are. These kind of social meanings become, you know, the things they want to actually invest in. So there's a seriousness in terms of, you know, being a punk becomes a way of life and people are drawn to these scenes because of that as well. So I'll leave this part of the uh, lecture there and then I'll go on to talk about the empirical parts in the next two sections.